This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and send the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. It's been quite a while since I recorded another episode of Hour of the Truth, but that's because actually every of my recording, every one of my recording is an Hour of the Truth. When I do book readings and all, all that, uh, I think my whole ministry can be called Hour of the Truth ever since I started this in uh, 2015 after the breaking off with Michael Adams in the time when we were doing in 2014 and begin of 2015 recordings and nothing but the truth. I very much like this name Hour of the Truth and I uh, also think it is very appropriate in all that I do so therefore these special quote-unquote Hour of the Truth series are not that frequent but um, because more or less everything that I do is the truth. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't know what less is. <laughs> All I do, I do with the conviction of that I tell you the truth. Everything is hour of the truth, so this is maybe kind of a goodbye. Um, some people who followed my reading uh, or my, my programs on hour of the truth know that uh, the last ones that I uploaded were these three parts of Donaldus Tramfios. I think that is about seven months ago. Let's have a little look on my channel. And we can see that here, uh, seven months ago, yeah. That was the last part. Fighting for Catholics by Hour of the Truth was the name of that one. And um, before that, I was reading this book from Samuel C. Gipp, An Understandable History of the Bible. Now, I don't retract anything that I said from the reading of that book, and um, but I just want to continue for a moment in that book that I have prepared for you here. We took off last time on page 50 of 114 of the PDF. 
where it uh, continues to say ripe for conquest. The last reading I did was on the 16th of July in 2017 and today we have the 9th of May in 2018 so that tells you that I have been very very busy doing other things instead of reading this book which I from the response that I got um, understood was never very much accepted with my viewers but that's not the reason that I'm gonna stop this one <sighs> Why am I not continuing this book? Well, when you see this quote that is from the author, Samuel Gibb, post-trip pre-wrath in August 13, 2013, he says, You know what I never call Jesus Christ? I never call him my Messiah. You know why? Well, you say he's the Messiah. He ain't your Messiah, unless you're a Jew. He's not your Messiah. Are you from the Gentile stock? All right. We were never promised a Messiah. <laughs> this is what Samuel C. Gibb said. And I found out about that somewhere during the last reading I did here, on the, the 16th of July 2017 and today. I mean, already I knew that for a few months now. But this really got me thinking. Why should I read a book, An Understandable History of the Bible, which cover we see here. You can get that book online for free as a PDF, as I have here, and you can buy the book, as you can see it here. But I thought to myself, why should I read a book when the author has no understanding of the Bible? We were never promised the Messiah. Well, as far as I understand the Bible, and let us go to the King James Bible, the 1611 King James Bible. Let's see. This is the website Bible Server. Uh, no, no, uh, this is the online Bible here. Let's, let's take this one. This is only the King James. And when we go to the Old Testament, uh, third chapter in the first book, Genesis, the first book of Moses, Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, we read that God says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow th shalt thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. <sighs> now you don't even need any need to go any further than this. It is verse uh, 15 of chapter 3 that is most important. When God here speaks to the serpent in the Garden of Eden, after the fall, after the serpent, meaning the devil, has um, I can't come to that word. <laughs> Verführt is the German word. Has seduced, sorry. After the serpent has seduced Eve to eat from the forbidden fruit, and she gave her husband also to eat, and mankind or man fell from the pure status that he was born in, that he was put in by our father. When God said this to the serpent, there were only two men, two of mankind, two examples of mankind living in this world. One was a male called Adam, and the other was a female called Eve. There were no Jews. There was no Israel. So Samuel Segeb, when he says, we were never promised a Messiah, then he understands Genesis 3 verse 15 in the sense that this was spoken to the Jews who didn't even exist at that moment. In my humble opinion, God loves every man. And that says that because he loves mankind that much 
and he loves his son, of course, too. Because he loves us all, he gives for all of us a solution. Otherwise, it would be stupid to put the gospel out to the Gentile nations. Why would there be any need to put the gospel out to the Gentile nations if Gentile nations could not be saved? And the only way that we are saved is by Jesus Christ, as the Gospel says. There is no other name given upon men by which he must be saved, but the name Christ Jesus. Or, and there is no other mediator between God and man, but the man Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Nobody. He didn't say only Jews get saved. So the Messiah... What does the Messiah what does Messiah stand for? Doesn't Messiah stand for salvation? Doesn't it say that we are all saved when we accept him? Doesn't it mean that everyone the Father sends to Jesus will be saved? When we knock, won't we be won't there be a, a door opened for us? I have very, very big trouble with this sentence of Samuel C. Gibb. Because he says, we were never promised the Messiah. So in other words, Jesus is not here to save us. But there is no other way for salvation. So what does Samuel C. Gibb say actually? That all Gentiles are lost? You know, I don't even want to go any further in this discussion. I'm just saying I love the book An Understandable History of the Bible that is here, that I read until page 50 here together with you and he is now telling about uh, the Reformation and, uh, and the Jesuit order that we were reading in. But I won't, I, I, I do not want to continue this book. Because of the simple reason there are so many other things to read, so many interesting things to read, that I don't want to read an author who says that I never was promised a Messiah. When I understand wholeheartedly this promise given by God in the Garden of Eden to the serpent, that he will put enmity between the, the, between the serpent and the woman, and between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and that the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head, and the serpent shall bruise his heel. And everybody who has a little understanding of the Bible knows that we are speaking here about Jesus Christ, the Messiah for mankind, the second Adam, who, yeah, didn't turn around the mistakes that Adam did, but who set things right. And through him we will be given back, our, given back our glory that we lost when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden so many years ago. I just don't want to continue reading in a book where the author makes statements like these. I hope you understand. I think I did nine recordings with these some 50 pages. If I remember well, I can put the link where you can download the book in the description box of the video and you can read it for yourself. But you know, uh, I've produced so many videos in English already. I, I, I did the whole reading of uh, Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. And those videos are just waiting to be uploaded. I read with um, with Brett Norman, uh, Cold World Babylon for the moment. We have some 70-ish 70, 70 uh, recordings done already in Volume 1 of the book. We are also getting through Volume 2 after that. There are so many interesting books that I want to read where the author is not saying such stupid and I really don't can do not can find any other word to describe what Samuel C. Gibb said there, stupid remarks, 
like we have never been promised a Messiah. You know that God took out in the Old Testament a certain people that he called his people, of course, because he wanted to protect his seed. That's why Israel came into being. And anyway, uh, the Messiah was for Israel, not only the Jews, right? The Jews are only one of the twelve tribes. So I absolutely disagree with what Samuel C. Gibbs said here. I don't understand why he said that. I don't care why he said that. The only point is he said that. And um, I think I even saw a video where I heard him saying it. So this picture is just the quote, but uh, I think I even heard him saying that in an audio recording or somewhere. I, I don't know anymore. But that's not important. The important thing is that I don't read a book of a man who proposes the King James only and has not the understanding that salvation is for all of mankind and not only for the Jews. Because that's what he's saying, in other words. Um, there are so many other things that I could read, and uh, I will go on continuing book readings, and I will read articles and other interesting stuff. But for the moment, I'm just going to say I will not continue reading this an understandable history of the Bible. So let's close this one here. That's done. Therefore, instead, I want to show you something else. And um, this is a newsletter that I regularly receive from Richard Bennett. He has his website, BereanBeacon.org. Uh, as you can see, a newsletter, BereanBeacon.org. Um, and um, I have received a few newsletters that I didn't have the time to read to you and make a uh, make a broadcast an hour of the truth from from so let's start today with this one let's see how far we get maybe I read the complete uh, newsletter to you maybe just a part I don't know you know, you can go to BereanBeacon.org and sign up for that newsletter and you will not only receive a internet version, as the one that I show you here, but you will also receive even a uh, paper version. I, I received that from uh, from his uh, home in America. Uh, every few months, few months I get a newsletter, a written edition, and I still have two lying here and maybe I'm going to read those too. But for the moment, this is one uh, 500 years later, the papacy is still Antichrist. Of course, this is a paper 500 years later, 500 years later, that he published on, as you can see here, the 30th of uh, October in 2017, a day, uh, or here even the 31st, uh, the day before, uh, or the day itself of... Um, Reformation Day, 500 years of Reformation. Martin Luther nailing the 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg, as that was in 2017. And I want to read to you a little bit of this newsletter, and then you can make up your own mind if you want to go and subscribe to Richard Bennett. I can only vouch for Richard Bennett in the way that he is a Catholic priest that has been 21 years with the Church of Rome, and by the grace of God, he has come out. God called him out of that satanic religion and opened his eyes. And ever since, he is dedicated to teach other Catholics to come out of the Roman Catholic Church and start a true personal relationship with their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And of course, I now call him intentionally Messiah, our Savior. Richard Bennett is very well studied in Latin because of 21 years in the Church of Rome. He speaks perfectly Latin and he is uh, capable of not only reading all the new encyclicals and, um, and bulls the Pope puts out, in the original Latin language that they are published first. But he also is that very well studied in the Pope speech 
that he understands these encyclicals and bulls in a way that gives us all a understanding of what is a the written word and b the meant word now you probably remember that in hour of the truth even before i did broadcasts with um, newsletters of richard bennett when we just have a look here at uh, hour of the truth okay we have the last few here from uh, donaldus tramfius but before that um, we did here uh, Hour of the Truth, Inquisition updates, no, uh, new events, a new Black Pope, English common law, where is this now? Uh, no. <laughs> oh my, that's, that's <laughs> a time ago, I didn't, I didn't know that. Computer is a little slow. Um, let's see, what is the message that I want to, want to show you here? We did these, um, uh, Uh, episodes, an hour of the truth. Uh, where is this here? Uh, I can't find this. This is strange. No, this is all too far away. Didn't we do that in uh, an hour of the truth? No, I'm just, I'm just guessing myself here. Um, this was this newsletter about Islam. Uh, Vatican Review. Understandable history. Here, yeah, yeah, here, here it is. Ah, that's the one that I was looking for. Two parts, and this is also based on Richard Bennett's newsletter. Let's just click on this, and then you can have a little look here. See, because this, this is, is a whole playlist. Show our so just they face from the onslaught of. Let's pause it. Hour of the Truth, the Roman Church pro uh, promotes Islam and accepts Islamic faith. And this is, as you can read in the description box here, a, a broadcast with uh, Brother Brett Norman and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Uh, Richard Bennett from www.bereanbeacon.org published a newsletter on the 15th of December 2015. Is that then? Yeah, uh, uh, 15, yeah, 12, 15, yeah, first the month, then the day, right? Um, which we will discuss and explain in the light of dealing with the multicultural agenda of the Antichrist by way of flooding Europe with refugees and the United States with Catholics from Middle and South America. Very, very interesting newsletter that uh, Richard Bennett there put out. That is, for example, one we did in Hour of the Truth, and we even started um, the very first broadcast of Hour of the Truth. As you can see is this one here. Uh, Hour of the Truth, the Catholic Lutheran Accord, part one. And we did, as you can see, three parts of that. And it says, this is the inaugural broadcast on the forum Hour of the Truth, where we will bring you regularly broadcasts dealing with the Bible prophecy teaching and exposing of the false antichrist Roman Catholic Jesuitical teachings. I, Jörg Lisman from YouTube channel Jörgler66, am the host of the shows and will have guests who will participate in conversations on above-mentioned subjects. The motto of the show, and so on, you all know this. In this broadcast, it says we will read a paper from Richard Bennett on the Catholic Lutheran Accord from 1999, by the way, the 31st of October 1999. That is a crucial part for the ecumenical movement that started with Vatican II and was a confirmation of the Council of Trent, a continuation of Roman counter-reformation. In this broadcast, I have two guests who will the sub the discuss the subject with me. That was in the time still when I was with Walt Stickel and uh, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. And we did three broadcasts, as you can see here, one, two, three, and they were all uh, and here's the conclusion. So it were four broadcasts, one, two, three, and then the conclusion. Um, and these were all broadcasts based on um, on this uh, newsletter of Richard Bennett that I received at that time. Okay. So this is not a first that I'm doing this, but I'm just saying this for people who maybe are not that familiar uh, with my work 
and even my work an hour of the truth who don't have gone that far back because I think it was more than 60 uh, recordings that I did in hour of the truth and not everybody has watched them all of course so by bringing you a little bit up to date showing you my inbox here you can see 500 years later the papacy is still the Antichrist then we have from the 23rd of February 2018 Roman Catholic Sacraments, a Ruthless Trafficking in Human Souls, Richard Bennett, another newsletter, The True History, The Real Patrick of Ireland, deals with St. Patrick's Day, published on 13th of March. I found that very interesting. Then we have Pope Francis, a man of his own words, not God's. That's a very interesting one. That's from the 18th of April. Um, we can have a little look at this. Um, and you will know that in a few days from today, because today is, as I said, the 9th of May, uh, on May 18th there is coming out a movie called Pope Francis, A Man of His Word. A movie that is directed by the German, uh, German director Wim Wenders. And uh, here the uh, Richard Bennis tell, tells us about that movie. Uh, here we have an interview with uh, Michael de Semlian, who... Richard Bennett works with and you know that when you follow my work on Hour of the Truth or my channel um, that I read the whole book of um, All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian on my channel last year and this is a very interesting newsletter with some very interesting links and even a video to Richard Bennett himself too where he warns us of this movie that is being published in a few days, Pope Francis, a man of his word. And then there's the last one, Submission to Pope Francis. And um, that also is a very, very interesting newsletter. But, as I said, I'm going to start at the bottom. And it's not my idea to read and explain to you this whole newsletter today, or maybe it is, I don't know, let's see. My first concern today was to inform you of me not continuing the reading of the book of Samuel C. Gibb, An Understandable History of the Bible. I read in the meantime, as you probably have seen in my videos um, from Chick Publications, the book Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible? I did five broadcasts on that, that you can look up on my channel if you don't know them. and. Um, that also was a very interesting book on the King James Version, but I just am not interested in continuing a book reading from a man who tells me that because I'm from the Gentile stock, we were never promised the Messiah, when the Bible itself in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 addresses all of mankind with the message of that there will come a Savior which in my understanding is nothing else but a messiah. Okay? So, let's just take another picture here. Take it on this side because I have my Firefox is on my right <laughs> and my Internet Explorer is on my left, so we're going to use this one. And we're going to have a look at um, the Berean Beacons newsletter from the 30th of October 2017 called 500 years later, the papacy is still the Antichrist. Even as many observe the 500th anniversary of the Great Reformation, still many religious leaders unite in putting asunder the truths of God's word that shaped Western civilization. Two important truths that emerged from the Reformation proclaim that justification is by faith alone and that the Roman Catholic papacy is the Antichrist of Biblical prophecy. In this article, Richard Bennett and Stuart Quint clearly identify this man of sin and make a call for Biblical protest. 500 years later, the papacy is still the Antichrist. Yeah, 500 years after Reformation Day, 1517, the papacy is still the Antichrist, the papacy was always the Antichrist, is today in 2018 and will be until our Lord returns. Because Second Thessalonians, let's just go there to the Bible, um, 
we go to the index and then we go to second Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 8 it says then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming so there is no question if Jesus Christ comes back there is no question how far the papacy will go with their agenda and there is no question where the papacy will end in the end he will be destroyed or but with the brightness of the coming of Jesus Christ and be consumed with the spirit of our Lord's mouth. That's it. No more, no less. Now, the propaganda machine of the Roman Catholic Church is ramping up in 2017. Rome continues to execute its grand strategy geared toward ignorant evangelicals defined at Vatican Council II over 50 years ago. You know, that council was running between the end of 1962 until 1965. Quote, little by little, as the obstacles to perfect ecclesial communion are overcome, all Christians will be gathered in a common celebration of the Eucharist. Unquote. Pope Francis has continued to minimize the differences between Rome and those who believe in the Bible. Some evangelicals have fallen in line with the Pope. The truth is that the reasons for those loyal to the gospel of Christ to protest now remain just as valid today as they were 500 years ago. One major area of dispute is the insatiable ambitions and claims of the Pope of Rome. On October 31, 1517, the reformer Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the church door at Wittenberg. Yes. Uh, this is most and for all understood in history, but there is, as I said already and mentioned it before, no historical proof of that fact. Where there is historical proof of, undeniable, is that the 95 Theses were printed and distributed all over Germany and later on all over Europe and that these 95 Theses brought the fall of the Roman Catholic Church in that time until they rose up again by initiating the order of Loyola, the Compagnie de Jesus, or the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits as we call it. And they started the Counter-Reformation, but until that moment the Roman Catholic Church took a big swing and lose of power and that was because of this 95 Theses of Martin Luther, whether he nailed them to the church door at Wittenberg or the castle door of the, of the, church, uh, of the church in the castle at Wittenberg, that, that doesn't matter. The point is that those 95 points were published and Martin Luther stood for it all his life. He goes on to say he was protesting the departure of the Roman Catholic Church from the Gospel of Jesus Christ. This event marked the start of the Great Reformation. Eventually, Luther's call for reform turned to separation from Rome because of its intense resistance to the teachings of Holy Scripture. This call for separation widely spread throughout Germany and across Europe. The nature and validity of the papacy remain a major thorn of contention. Rome claims the Pope is the vicar or substitute of Christ. Luther and other Bible believers through the centuries view the Pope as enemy of Christ. Has Rome changed its position on the absolute power of the Pope? What does God's word say about the issue? Who is the true vicar of Christ? The Holy Spirit is the true Vicar of Christ. Before his return to God, the Father in Heaven, Jesus Christ promised his disciples another would come and serve as his substitute on earth to instruct them in all truth and remind them of all he had already taught them. The Lord Jesus Christ's words were, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, 
whatsoever I have said unto you. And you see this little, tiny little numbers that are footnotes where he gives the Bible verse or the other documented facts where he bases this newsletter on. I'm not going to click on these every time. You can look that up for yourself when you get that newsletter. Concerning this third person of the Trinity, who was to be his substitute, the Lord promised that <laughs> when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now I have to stop here. Apparently there is a little bit of Roman Catholic leaven also in Richard Bennett, right? Third person of the Trinity. The Trinity is a Babylonian teaching and not a teaching that will be substantiated by Hour of the Truth or supported by Hour of the Truth. There is no Trinity and there are no three persons. Um, I don't even want to go into that right now. But there's a very fine um, declaration of belief, if you can call it, um, of Martin Luther in the small called articles. And in them you find what the real biblical teaching is, that the Father is born of nobody, the Son born from the Father, and the Holy Spirit goes out of Father and Son. That is the quote-unquote Godhead, and there is surely no Trinity. You see, whether you follow Richard Bennett or you follow whoever, always make sure that you eat the meat and spit out the bones. And when Richard Bennett says here concerning this third person of the Trinity who was to be his substitute, I can do nothing else but shake my head and unbelieve that Richard Bennett falls for the deception of the Trinity. The Trinity is a Babylonian concept and taught by the Roman Catholic Church but is absolutely unbiblical. Mark my words, this is what I said about the Trinity. And if you want to understand the Godhead correctly, do your study in the King James Bible. The only preserved word in English of God today available in 2018. And the more you read that book, the more you will understand that the Father and the Son are two persons, but the Holy Spirit is never addressed to as a person. The Father is God. The Son is God, the Holy Spirit is not God. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to be venerated, doesn't want to be prayed to. Jesus Christ has nothing, has no problem with wor being worshipped. When he was on earth and people fell down on his knees and worshipped him, he didn't rebuke them. But the Holy Spirit is not to be worshipped. And of course the Father is to be worshipped. So there is a distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they are surely not a trinity. Nevertheless, we continue here with a quote from the Bible where it says, When he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts people of sin as he makes sinners realize their lost condition and their need for God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit brings, out, uh, brings a soul from a state of deadness and rebellion in sin to forgiveness and life in Christ. This is because our innate dispositions are prone to sin. Nothing but divine power can bring about our salvation. That's right. This is a very true and very important sentence to understand. Nothing but divine power can bring about our salvation. Nothing that we can do on ourselves. It is grace alone. It is by the grace of God that we are saved and not through our works. God is no respecter of persons. Yeah. Nothing but divine power can bring about our salvation. 
I'm sorry for the noise here, but I just have to close my shades here because it's getting dark and otherwise I have to put on light and otherwise all the mosquitoes come in here. Now this miracle of grace is spoken of in scripture as the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. In the believers lives the Holy Spirit has full immediate and universal influence. The scriptures teach that, quote, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face beholding, as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, unquote. The work of the Spirit is transforming. We are changed from one degree of glorious grace into another until by that same grace one day we will be perfect in him in glory for ever in heaven. How much therefore should we as Christians prize the full and complete ministry of the Holy Spirit? There is no correction here. Everything is correct that he states here. And the interesting point is that he says the work of the Spirit transforming is transforming we are changed from one degree of glorious grace unto another you know salvation is or or, or or righteousness is imputed in a moment into us through Jesus Christ but to become holy that is a progress of long time salvation is instantly but to make us holy that is a whole trip we have to undertake now Francis's blasphemous claim as the vicar of Christ let me just check my camera here for a moment okay even 500 years after the commencement of the Reformation Rome has not backed down from its inflated assessment of the papacy Contrary to the words of Jesus, Rome insists that the head of her church is that substitute or vicar. Quote, the Pope, Bishop of Rome and Peter's successor is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and of the whole company of the faithful. For the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme and universal, means Catholic, power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise." Unquote. Now that he is not the successor of Peter is something we spoke extensively about when we read the book um, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil, by the book by Martin Luther from 1545 that I read to you uh, in, uh, at the closing of last year and the beginning of this year. Those videos are uploaded to my channel as you may remember. And if you don't, well, then have a look at them in the playlist. Um, so, we're going to continue here. Despite the clear teaching of Scripture on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Vatican still attempts to usurp his role. Rome dogmatically states, quote, The Pope enjoys, by divine institution, supreme, full, immediate and universal power in the care of souls, unquote. It is impossible for a mortal man such as Pope Francis to enjoy such supreme, full, immediate and universal power in the care of souls. Such absurd claims would imply that the Pope were endowed with divine power. The Pope's central authority, by which he judges all things, is officially called by the term Holy See rather than the Vatican. The term Holy See stands for the central authority of the Church, which encompasses the tiny sovereign state of Vatican City. However, the universal scope of the above citation also reveals Rome's ambitions beyond Vatican City. Indeed, the Holy See claims to represent a worldwide community and not only the citizens of Vatican City. The Pope is head of a sovereign state and at the same time a central authority to a worldwide community. Furthermore, 
Rome's Code of Canon Law defines its views of the authority of the Holy See. The first see is judged by no one. Unquote. The first see, which is the Holy See, is judged by no one. Well, Holy See, only God can make things holy and the Pope is not holy, so you get the jest. The papacy declares itself to be supreme, accountable to no one. Only the Pope is the sole judge of what is right and wrong, while simultaneously demanding that no one can judge it. The audacity of the Holy See reaches its zenith in the civil and political arenas as it proclaims, quote, It is solely the right of the Roman Pontiff himself to judge those who hold the highest civil office in his state, unquote. In other words, the Pope sits above all world leaders and has the right to judge those who govern nations. What does the Bible say? Well, when we go to Bible Index and we look in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, and there it says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The kings of the world have committed fornication with the woman that rides the beast, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Yeah? This is exactly what Richard Bennett here is talking about. The Pope sits above all world leaders and has the right to judge those who govern nations, because all these kings of the world, these governments, have committed fornication with the whore of Babylon. It's that simple to understand the Bible and to see Bible prophecy fulfilled daily even in our world that we live in. One should not be deceived by the small physical size of Vatican City. While Vatican City by area is the smallest independent state in the world of 108 acres, the Roman state has re-emerged as one of the greatest in political intrigue. Well, this is a very interesting point because in the book of Daniel it speaks of the little horn. You know, Rome pagan falls into ten different kingdoms and ten different horns and out of the ten horns I saw another little horn arise and that little horn was the Antichrist or is the Antichrist still a horn is a kingdom and the Vatican Vatican State is a kingdom and the Pope is its king its sovereign and because of all the other governments in the world, all the other kings of the earth have committed fornication with the whore, he is above them all. And the proof is that the little horn, the smallest of the ten kingdoms, only 108 acres big, is the one who rules them all. Has always been that way and will always be that way until our Lord Jesus Christ finally returns. The Roman state has re-emerged as one of the greatest in political intrigue, of course, with the help of the Jesuits. To quote Catholic historian Lord Acton, the Vatican is, quote, the, the fiend skulking behind the crucifix, unquote. This stems from the fact that Rome has been re-established as a sovereign state with civil power, wielding much sway in national and international law, particularly in the nations in which she has papal nuncios as ambassadors. Yeah, and I think that is in most countries, and especially in all countries who have a concordat with the Roman Catholic Church. Because when a country has a concordat with the Roman Catholic Church, it accepts the supremacy of the spiritual above the temporal power. At present, she maintains civil relations with 174 countries at embassy level. According to the Catholic Almanac, quote, an apostolic nuncio has the diplomatic rank of ambassador, extraordinary and plenipotentiary. A nuncio has precedence among diplomats in the country to which he is accredited and serves as dean 
of the diplomatic corps of, uh, on state occasions. Unquote. Paper Rome's history, i.e. her apparent demise in the past and her current resurgence in modern affairs, appear to parallel the description of the harlot of Babylon, after whom the world marvels revealed in Revelation 17, where we just read a little part from. The Papal Apparatus for Controlling People's Souls In contrast to the Holy Spirit carrying for souls by his own power, Pope Francis by himself is incapable in, of administering quote, universal power in the care of souls. Unquote. Consequently, Pope Francis requires a vast hierarchy of henchmen to control the people. This hierarchy of power, also known as the Magisterium, consists of cardinals, titular patriarchs, archbishops, metropolitans, coadjutor, uh, coadjutor archbishops, diocesan bishops, bishops, episcopal vicar, uh, eparchus, apostolic vicars, apostolic prefects, apostolic administrators, and vicars general. The authority of this hierarchy extends to priests who seek to exert Rome's dominion over local members of the parish. Pope Francis elaborates on instrument of control wielded by the Roman clergy as in the following quote. But first I want to go into this magisterium. Do you know why it is called the magisterium? Well, why don't we go to the Bible? Because the Bible will tell us. When we go to the book of Acts, chapter 8, we read that Philip was with the Samaritans, Samaritans and he taught the Samaritans about the gospel of Jesus Christ and then he met a person as we read in verse 9 it says but there was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one. Now what did we just read here? He used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. What does the Bible say about sorcery and bewitching? Our Father condemns that, right? So we are not speaking about a quote-unquote Christian. Yeah? We are not talking about a God-fearing person. We are talking about a sorcerer. Now, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. Hmm. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. This is a key sentence of the things we are going to understand later on. And when Simon saw that through laying of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps that he, uh, the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And then answered Simon and said, 
Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Simon is not even able to pray to the Father for him, for his forgiveness of his sin here. No, he says, pray ye to the Lord for me. Now, why is this important in uh, regards of the magisterium? Because we are speaking here of a person that is here called Simon, that is addressed all through known history, not only biblical, but even ex-biblical, of Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer. And there is a book, and uh, we're going to have a little look. Just uh, give me a second, and I will try to open this one. Um, let's see, uh, Magus, I think, is in the title, right? No? Okay, then Simon. I'm going to read that book and uh, record that, of course, for you. Yeah, my disk has to wake up. So we see this booklet here. This Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer, or Saint Peter, speaking of the Apostle, meets the competition. A book by Ernest L. Martin. And here we read, Saint Paul established the Congregation of Christ at Rome, Simon the Sorcerer established the Church of Rome. Now we see this is not a very long book, it's just 34 pages, and I will read this, and this is probably going to be my next English um, project that I'm going to do, also because it is not that long. Now, if you want to hear somebody else talk about this, then I advise you to go to First Demandment Radio. Um, you know, you have this uh, video channel of First Amendment Radio. I'm going to show that to you also. Uh, here is First Amendment Radio. Open the channel up here. Uh, where there is Tom Fress with Inquisition Update doing his daily, uh, his daily work. As you can see here, for example, he is now reading Key to Pope Francis' Identity. He is also reading newsletters of uh, Richard Bennett. That is not why I'm doing that. I'm not in competition with, with Tom, and he does a much better job than I do. But when you go to um, yeah, when you go to playlists here, you won't find that. But you have to go to, f to First Amendment Radio itself. So, uh, let's see. www.first Amendment Radio dot net and let's go to that website. Here you have First Amendment Radio dot com dot net, uh, dot net. It says here dot com, but here in the address it says um, dot net. Yeah, and that pop up you can run that. I do that also normally because that's the audio player when you can listen live to uh, First Amendment Radio, but the point that I want to make is when you are a supporter of First Amendment Radio and you subscribe for 15, 25, 50, 100 dollars a month, whatever you can afford, even with 15 dollars, um, you get access to the archives. Yeah. Um, here are the archives. This is everything that is in the archives. Among that, of course, there is Inquisition Update. Now, this is just the last five days where you can listen to Inquisition Update here. Uh, when you click on this, this is just uh, the daily program that Tom Fress does. But there is an archive that goes back to of Inquisition Update 2009. So, when you are a, a paying subscriber to First Amendment Radio via the archives, you can go to Inquisition Update in 2009 archive and you can listen to Tom Fress reading that book, uh, Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer. Now, why am I reading that book be when Tom read that already in 2009? Well, because I am not Tom. And I listen to that book reading, and I find it a wonderful book reading, and I advise everybody to go there and listen to that. But I'm going to do my own thing, and I want to read that book for myself. And while I'm reading it, I can also share that with you. That's why I'm doing it. Point is, 
go to First Amendment Radio and you will see that you will you can have a good deal for a few bucks to enter that archive and listen to everything that Tom Fress in the last uh, seven, eight years, uh, 2009, 2018, in the, in the last nine years, put out there. You can read that. So, this hierarchy of power, as we said, here, also known as the Magisterium. Why is it called the Magisterium? Because he is Simon Magus, Simon the Sorcerer. Yeah? He is Simon Magus, and he is the founder that established the quote-unquote Church of Rome. The Church of Rome was founded on magic, on the magisterium of Simon the Sorcerer, who we just learned of in Acts chapter 8 in the Bible. You see how all these things come together? So, this hierarchy, the author continues here, this hierarchy of power, also known as the magisterium, consists of cardinals, titular patriarchs, and so on and so on. We read that already. The authority of this hierarchy extends to priests who seek to exert Rome dominion over local members of the parish. Pope Francis elaborates on instrument of control wielded by the Roman clergy. And now the newsletter continues for a few moments, so we're going to read it uh, yeah, just for the moment here coming until the end. Because we've reached an hour but I will speak, uh, speed up a little bit that we can continue this newsletter until the end. Then we have done this. However, this is a quote, it is not enough to simply ask the Lord for forgiveness in one's own mind and heart because Jesus himself entrusted to the Church the ministry of the forgiveness of sins. It is necessary humbly and trustingly to confess one's sins to a minister of the Church. In the celebration of this sacrament, the priest represents not only God, but also the whole community. Unquote. Contradicting Francis, the Bible states, quote, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Unquote. Time does not permit for an extensive discussion of the numeral carnal scandals committed by Catholic priests and hierarchy. The outcome of Pope Francis' deception is with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Such apostasy is marked not by open hostility but by hypocrisy and deceit which to the world appears righteous and holy. Apostasy is a withdrawal from the true gospel and true godliness. Now, the conclusion? The Roman Pope continues to resist Christ 500 years after the starting of the Reformation. 500 years later. An examination of the office of Pope Francis clearly reveals his association to Christ. He is not the vicar of Christ. Rather, he exalts himself in the place of or anti-Christ. Roman Catholics refer to the Pope as His Holiness. Such a title exclusively belongs to God. God is the only being whose very nature is holy. Concerning the Pope's assumed title His Holiness, the Roman Catholic Church claims the following divine attribute. Quote, the Supreme Pontiff, in virtue of his office, possesses infallible teaching authority when, as Supreme Pastor and Teacher of all the faithful, he proclaims what a definitive act uh, that a doctrine of faith or morals is to be held as such. Unquote. The papacy's claim to infallibility conflicts with God's position as truly infallible. Thus, Rome's official claim in reality exalts the Pope above all that is called God, as we can read in the Bible. Yeah? In 23, this is in uh, the Greek word for above can mean in the place of as much of. This latter meaning appears more applicable to the position of the Pope in the place of rather than above. Strong's Concordance of the Bible. 
anywhere. Continue likewise, the earned righteousness of Christ Jesus after the resurrection gave him all power in heaven and in earth. Yet, as stated earlier, the Pope takes upon himself the unlimited authority for the universal care of souls and is judged by no one. Yeah, no man, but our Father in heaven will judge him seriously. While time remains before Christ returns and vanquishes his foes, let us flee from the false religion of the popes opposed to him. Instead, let us humbly learn and obey the Lord Jesus Christ's counsel and command, quote, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move with them one of their fingers. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. And this is the conclusion of the newsletter from Richard Bennett, 500 years later, and the end of this broadcast on Hour of the Truth, where I explain to you why I will not continue reading that book from Samuel C. Gibb, An Understandable History of the Bible. Instead, I advise you to watch my five-part reading of Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible, that book from Chick Publications that I read with permission from uh, David Daniels, who runs Chick Publications now, after Jack Chick uh, passed away, I think in uh, somewhere 2017, last year that was. And uh, read that, and, and also uh, I will put the uh, the link to download an understandable history of the Bible book in the description box of this video. Download it, read it for yourselves. But I will not openly read that book anymore because Samuel C. Gibb is teaching a false gospel when he says that the Messiah was only promised to the Jews, which I rebuked with Genesis 3.15. Thanks for watching and listening. God bless you. Until next time. Maranatha. Oh, uh -huh.